Wonderful. Welcome, delegates, to one of our final sessions at this HBR conference. We're super delighted to have a very special guest joining us here today. Uh, Mr. Bob Sternfeld serves as the global managing partner of McKinsey & Company. He's an alumni of Stanford University for his undergrad and Oxford for his uh, uh, postgrad studies, where he uh, was a Rhodes Scholar, and he now serves on the board of the Rhodes Trustees. Bob, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, thanks for having me. And, um... Maybe even before we begin the, the the chat, which I'm looking forward to, let me uh, let me apologize. My uh, my face may look like I uh, I just um, went through a uh, a fight. <laughs> I, um, I I'm allergic to bees, and I was out on a run yesterday, and a bee stung me on the nose. And oh, wow. <laughs> by by this time yesterday evening, my eyes had swollen shut, so I went and got some medication. But I'm still uh, <laughs> I still look pretty swollen, so I, uh, I apologize for that, and uh, uh, I'll do the best I can. Oh, no worries at all. We appreciate you still coming, of course, after this B incident. Um, so uh, my name is Neil Patel, and I'm the president of HBR here at Harvard, and I'll be moderating this talk alongside my colleague, Angela. Yeah, I'm Angela, um, also part of the HBR team here, um, and we're really excited to have Bob um, to get started with the first question. Um, before we actually talk about any of your work at McKinsey, we'd love to talk a little bit about your background. Um, so um, how has your upbringing shaped your core values in both your professional career and personal life today? Well, um, th thanks uh, to start there, because I do think, um, you know, the experiences that we go through do shape your, your outlook on life. And uh, there's no way I can do, do justice to all of it, but um, I, I might take a, a snapshot uh, Angela and I, I kind of um, snapshot is I, I grew up in a what was a pretty small agricultural town in in Northern California, a town called Lodi, and um, there were you know maybe a couple things that um, I think really imprinted on me. Um, one was my um, my grandmother who um, had immigrated from Finland with her mother um, when Russia and Finland were battling around the time of the First World War, and. Um, she always used a Finnish expression with me um, whenever I was uh, kind of in doubt or um, uh, or doubting myself, which is sisu. And uh, the the best translation from Finnish to English, I would say, is grit. Um, and so, you know, I'm giving up on something, or you know, I'm saying, oh, it's too hard. And she's just, <laughs> grandma would always come back and say, remember, you have sisu. And uh, it's it's stuck in my brain to this day. So one aspect is the the strength of my grandmother and. Uh, as a Finnish immigrant and this notion of grit, uh, which I think is, you know, serves us all well, you know, particularly as we navigate through, through tough times. Um, the, the second would be, um, uh, I would say, a, a notion of inclusion. Um, you know, the, the, the town that I um, came from had, my high school had about 3,000 kids. Um, 2,500 were native um, Spanish speakers uh, with Hispanic and Latino background, given the agricultural area. And, and most of my best friends um, were Japanese American and uh, their parents or grandparents had come a hundred years ago. Um, many of them had parents that were, um, were interned during the war. Um, and uh, I learned firsthand um, how brutal that was uh, quite frankly. And, and my best friend in particular had, his dad came back from the camp, had to sell his farm beforehand and had to earn money as a picker to buy his farm again. And, and so this notion of inclusion and how we can never de-emphasize that, um, you know, going forward has kind of stuck with me. Um, and so maybe those might just be two aspects of, uh, of the background. I could go on, but I know we want to cover a lot of different questions today. Uh, wonderful. Well, well, thank you for sharing that, Bob. Um, so I'd like to shift gears now and, and talk about uh, McKinsey and from then your work there, of course. Um, so I had the chance to spend the summer in the San Francisco office, and I thought it was fantastic. Um, but you, Probably not enough time in the office itself, but... Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, but you've, well, I mean, you've been at the firm for over 25 years now, so could you walk us through sort of what your journey throughout the firm has been like, like you know, and some of the lessons that you've gotten? Yeah, you know, I, I would say if you look back on any journey that any of us go on, you can always tell a coherent story, um, but I'd be lying if, if while we're going through these journeys, they, they appear coherent. Um, you know, I, I joined the firm um, out of Oxford, uh, mainly as, a, as an idea of, hey, I'd spend two years to get some real uh, applied um, skill in business before going back and, and um, studying economics. 
And, um, and I thought, hey, this would be great. Um, so I joined in San Francisco. At about that two year mark, um, uh, Mandela was released and we decided as a firm to open an office in South Africa. And uh, I thought this idea of being able to contribute to a society in transformation would be outstanding. Uh, and so, okay, hey, just two more years, that'll be fun and then I'll leave. <laughs> And, and then came back to the, to the West Coast after that, um, right after the dot-com crash, to help um, companies restructure um, and really learn how to get in and help somebody survive through really tough periods, all right? Two years, that'd be great. And, and if I fast forward, deal, you know, the, it's, it's been more of a, rather than a 25-year pre-thought journey, it's been these two year cycles of do I think I'd actually be learning more here and developing more than anywhere else in the world. And, uh, and so far that's been the case. And, and maybe now it's, it's, it's a three year cycle versus a two year cycle because our terms for managing partner are three years. But uh, you know, I think this will be a great development experience. And if it's not, then you know, I'll hand the keys to somebody else at the end of this. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, really um, cool to hear about uh, your thought process through a lot of these. I'm um, curious to hear about after 25 years, if there's anything um, else besides this potentially two or three year cycle um, about your work that has kept you continually engaged and excited after so long. You know, I, it, I, I've been spending a lot of time listening to, uh, to our folks around the firm. And I, I've started to now travel. Um, it's not easy, but I've been to maybe 10 of our US offices. I was in Mexico two weeks ago in Monterey in Mexico City. And then last week I was in Europe. I went to Germany and, and Sweden. And I think when I hear our folks, Angela, it kind of echoes the same as, as me, which is one is this notion of, um, of development, unrivaled development. And, and do I feel that I, anybody, would learn more in my next couple of years than anywhere else in the world. And I, I do think that that, as we think about our own journeys is important for all of us, right? And this notion, um, you know, you might have heard Satya at Microsoft talking about, you know, lifelong learning and being the learn it all versus the know it all. I think that really resonates with all of us because the world's changing so fast. And so one aspect of development, I think the other aspect is building, um, you know, versus, uh, working. <laughs> and, and what I mean by this is, is there's some notion that I am empowered to shape both the professional career that I want and in turn, um, the firm. Um, and fr from a very early age, uh, it, it, in terms of joining. And, and so the, this, I think the second notion is, can I go build something that I'm excited about? You know, for me, it was as an associate um, building a new office in South Africa. Uh, or later um, actually building a practice when I led the private equity practice as a, as a, as a partner versus a senior partner. So maybe the second notion is, is um, empowering folks to build. And then the, the third notion that I've, I've maybe increasingly appreciated is um, the network um, of peers who can actually, we can co-mentor each other. Um, it's an amazing group of people in, in our firm and this idea that when you hit a rough patch, do you have lifelines? Um, and, and the notion of lifelines, I think back to that notion of Sisu, Sisu is great, but you know, if you don't have somebody who can help pull you up, um, it's a lot more lonely. And so those might be the three aspects is are there networks? Are you building something? And do you have the, you know, unrivaled development experience in, in kind of short cycles? Yeah, no, I think that that's absolutely three very valuable lessons that you've drawn. Um, and so for the next year, I want to sort of take you back to your 22-year-old self when you were just uh, graduating out of Stanford. Um, and I want to ask, what advice would you give to that younger version of Bob that you've learned from the past 25 years of, of your career? Um, you know, it's, it, I, I would say a couple things. I was actually just talking to my my oldest daughter, who just finished her first year at, at university, and uh, we were having this conversation. And I think one notion is um, is not to get too tracked too early, um, and how to actually ensure that this notion of diversity of experience um, um, persists. And and the reason I say this is, and it, it goes back, Angela, to a bit of where you and I were going, which is. Um, the world's changing so fast that one of the key aspects 
versus building expertise is building the ability to acquire new expertise. Um, and so do you build that muscle? And, and I think one notion of my 22 year old self is I probably was a little too obsessed of getting too narrow too fast. <laughs> and, and so this, as opposed to building a learning muscle, right, would, would be one thought. Um, the second is um, the things that I, the best decisions I've made um, along my professional career um, were going against traditional advice that I got from what I thought my mentors and, and sponsors were. Um, should I go to South Africa? Well, you can do it, but this would be risky for your career. And you know, why would you want to do this? Um, coming back to the West Coast and focusing on operations and turnaround work when the whole thing was all about tech and growth, why would you want to do this? Um, and I, I, I think the second aspect is this courage to do what you want to do. So if, if one notion is building the learning muscle, the second is the courage. And most people will try, even with the best intent, to, to, to shave off aspects of that courage um, and actually do things that are more risk averse. And so how to, how to take more risk, Zeal, might be the second you know, aspect. And, and then the third, and it links back to these lifelines, is um, I'd spend a bit, you know, the, the, the bonds and friends that I've made with both clients, with uh, people in the, in the business community, and with our own colleagues have been fabulous. I feel, though, that I could have done 15% more along the way in terms of really investing to build those relationships, um, because they're what I remember now, 20, 25 years later. Um, those might just be three, you know, three thoughts to think about. Yeah, thanks so much for that advice. I think like bringing that advice to where we are today, um, the theme of our conference is actually to re reinventing with resilience. Um, so from your perspective, um, what opportunities do leaders and organizations have today as we enter this new normal, um, whatever that looks like to you um, with where we are today? Yeah. Well, to, to the degree that anything is normal anymore, Angela, right? You know, I, I just think it's a different phase, but I might even hesitate from what, do we just get used to dynamic versus, you know, normal? Um, you know, who, who knows, right? Um, but um, I get super excited about um, the framing of what you have been spending time on. And, um, and I think we're at a unique moment where we have obligation as change agents in the world around us to figure out um, how do we want to affect change? And uh, you know, the, the folks in our um, McKinsey Global Institute, which is one of the um, leading think tanks, if you will, in the world has, has done a bunch of work that says, look, there's two paths for the next decade. Um, you know, and there is one path with accelerated global GDP growth. And there's a path with more anemic growth. And, um, and all that that entails. And, and part of what I kind of look at is I look at all of the forces coming around us, a recovery from the pandemic and fits and starts, but we are closer to the end than the beginning. This idea that particularly large enterprise and even to some degree government has figured out how to use technology in a different way by having to operate remotely. There's a massive opportunity there. Um, the notion that no one is debating sustainability and environment anymore, right? That wasn't there 18 to 20 months ago. Um, and we all know that this is now an existential question of our time. And increasingly, um, let's call it uncertain geopolitics in the world um, in terms of different nation states. And, and you kind of put all that together and you say, boy, um, do we wanna be front foot or do we wanna be conservative? And, and, and for me, Angela, I kind of think this is the notion to be bolder, um, to be bolder as, as leaders. And um, one of the things that, that I've been talking to both our colleagues within our firm, but more importantly, our clients about is, um, is how do we do that? How do we do that? And one of the things that I've, I've, I've articulated, and, and others have done this as well, but I think it's, it's an idea of how do we actually make good on this, is the notion of sustainable, inclusive growth. How do we actually accelerate the world across sustainable, inclusive growth? And I, I'd hit growth first. Um, as I had mentioned, we have two scenarios with almost double the rate of GDP growth in one versus the other. How to, how to 
cat catalyze that. And you know, we tend to work with large enterprise. Well, it's things like, are we thinking long-term versus being obsessed with quarterly earnings? As we think about cash on the balance sheet in enterprise being at an all-time high, are we making bold multi-year investments? As we think about um, uh, the idea of, um, uh, of bold bets, are we rewiring our organizations to move faster against all these things because we learned a bunch in COVID? So there's one aspect of, I think, growth where I, I track it back to leaders of business. And can we get leaders of business to be bolder around multi-year investments right now, which in turn would drive um, economic growth? That's on the growth side. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the inclusive side, we've done a lot of work that says, look, if we grow, and we've seen this around the world around us, and we, we hollow out the middle, the pillars of society will break down. If the gap between the have and have nots widen, things just break. We've also seen a lot on the talent market that we're in for a huge talent shortage, huge talent shortage going forward. And so this notion of actually inclusive, and we've done work, look, if, if we can actually make a substantial investment around gender parity, our work says there's 13 trillion to be added to the global GDP by 2030. If we can actually close the, the race equity gap in terms of our, the black population in the US, there's 1.6 trillion to be added, 1.6 trillion. So there's a massive opportunity, I think, as we think about this to also be put an inclusive dimension around growth. And then finally, I, I close on the sustainability side, which that I think there's a, a real opportunity to move from greenwashing to, to true doing. And I will kind of flag three things, you know, a notion of how to move in a material way. Is this actually transforming the company? The second aspect is to do it economically and reject the notion that these measures can't be made economic for large enterprise. We have a ton of work that actually says it's an and versus an or, and to move at a pace. You know, quite frankly, most of the commitments are too back-ended, right? They're multi-generational commitments. How do we pull all this in by 10 years? And I, I think if we do that, Angela, this notion of um, we can decarbonize the planet, we can actually upskill a mass of folks to join the kind of upper middle class in society, and we can actually double the rate of GDP growth. That sounds pretty exciting to me, and it's not unrealistic <laughs> right now. So it just may be a, a, a notion for us. So you highlighted some of the opportunities that you mentioned there that come with reinvention, and, and also mentioned the MGI report that, that touched on this. Um, but there's also significant challenges, as you can imagine, of not defaulting back to pre-pandemic norms and what we had uh, before 2020. And so how do you think about tackling through these challenges and reasoning through that, especially from the perspective of, of managers and, and people who lead large enterprises? You know, this is my biggest worry right now, Zeal. It, it's my biggest worry um, because, um, look, on, on the one side, it's clear that we all figured out, and if I take a, a, a large enterprise point of view for, for a second, we learned how to move a lot faster during COVID. Um, and the, the examples are endless. You know, Verizon closing 70% of their stores and retraining thousands of employees to be inside sales within weeks, right? It would have been unheard of. Um, curbside pickup, you know, being delivered in two days at Dick's Sporting Goods, which was an 18 month queue in the IT backlog before COVID, right? So, and you know, product development time slashed, et cetera. You can go through all this. I, the worry I have is we're not figuring out how to take what I think was adrenaline-based speed and make it sustainable speed. And, and in lieu, back to your point, Angela, of, of normal, people are going back to what they had before. You know, where are we right now, right? We're, we're late August, yeah? So what happens in most of corporate America as you, as you get to September, um, it's budgeting season. Right, because a lot of our on calendar year uh, is the fiscal year. And when I've asked clients, um, well, how are you approaching it? They say, oh, I'm going back to the old budgeting process. Why? You just learned how to do continuous resource reallocation, and yet you're going back to that old muscle zeal that we had before, which is a fairly ponderous. And I said, do you like your budgeting process? They're like, mm, not really. <laughs> Why? Why? And so I do think there's this moment to say, let me redesign 
what large enterprise should look like. Right? Am I absolutely hyper-focused on priorities? Am I encouraging risk-taking? Angela, the point that I raised earlier about you know, what I worry about, am I encouraging risk-taking in my organization? Can I flatten the hierarchies? Too many layers. Who likes being in the middle? Right? Who likes being in the middle? Can I flatten this? And can I get a lot more purposeful about when we get together? And when, you know, that's a tricky topic and the return to work and all this, but there are some things of making the most in terms of developing skills, getting alignment and being creative problem solving when we're together. Those should be the things we do together. And then we have a dividend of doing stuff individually. So I think there's a moment to rewire the, you know, the organization as well. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to end sort of this, moderated session. Um, and before we dive into one or two audience questions, I uh, want to end on an important topic. Um, so here at Harvard, one of our core values um, from our five core values or our five core values in general suggest um, how we can create an inclusive culture. Um, and I know that that's something, this idea of diversity and um, inclusivity is something you already touched on um, and is very important to McKinsey as well. So we'd love to hear a little bit about the strides McKinsey has made on diversity and inclusion and how you're continually working to advance these moving forward as global managing partner. Um, look, th this is mission critical. And I I'll tell you right now, um, I don't ever want to declare success here, right? Mm -hmm. I want to be continually obsessed with how we get better on this topic, Angela, continually obsessed, because um, I'm not sure you ever are perfect <laughs> on, on this dimension. And, and, you know, just many of you know this, but just the starting point for us, right, is, um, you know, our, our dual mission on the one hand is around client, which is about substantial lasting performance improvement in our client. And the other is a firm around talent that attracts, develops, excites, and retains exceptional people. And we start with a pretty diverse mix. We're in 67 countries. We have folks that speak 137 uh, languages. Um, so we're, we're pretty diverse to begin with. Um, and it's in the core of kind of what we celebrate and, and who we are. Um, we've invested a lot in the knowledge side of this um, to help everybody gain conviction that diversity and inclusion are not only good things to do, but they also um, are incredibly beneficial in terms of performance. And you know, go through and look at any of the, the um, reports that we've had, diversity wins, women in the workplace, power parity, um, some of the new stuff coming out of our Black Economic Mobility Institute, right? It's just uh, unarguable. And some of the numbers that I highlighted earlier, that 13 trillion and 1.6 trillion, right? These are not insignificant numbers. So there is a real case. And I, I'm proud that we help with the fact base. I, I am also proud of the progress we've made um, with a caveat that we're not there yet. Um, you know, we're now 46% women in our firm globally. We got to get it to 50 plus, right? But 46 is a lot higher than what it was six or seven years ago. And since in the last five years, we've also doubled the number of female partners. Not there yet, right? But you know, this is the, the rate in terms of wiring and change in our firm. And then in 2019, we welcomed the largest class of Black, Hispanic, and Latino summer interns that we've ever had. Um, so the, the trend line is, is good. Um, I also would say many of you saw over the the last 18 months, we made a commitment to act in 10 ways, um, in the, particularly in the, in the U.S. context um, on, in, with the Black community. And um, you know, the 10 actions around racial equity, we've made, we've made real progress. Um, we, we offered for free um, uh, our leadership academy to Black executives. And we've put 11,000 Black executives in, in the U.S. through this. It's now going to expand to include Hispanic, Latino, and Asian. And I want to get to 30,000 uh, in terms of the next 12 months. I, I mentioned we launched the Black Economic Mobility Institute, um, which has had its first publications out um, uh, in less than a year. I really credit that team for working quickly. But I'm not happy at the publication stage. I, I actually want this to convert to action. And are we getting um, action in society around racial equity? And maybe uh, finally, you know, we made a commitment to double our hiring uh, in terms of uh, black colleagues. And, and one area that I just uh, would call out specifically as we make progress, we learned that we can actually um, uh, do a good chunk of our work through knowledge centers. These are our mm -hmm. folks who work with teams from hubs around the world. And we just launched one in Atlanta 
that's working exclusively with historically black colleges and universities. You know, 50 people now within this center. We didn't even have that, you know, 12 months ago. So it's progress, but um, but I feel that there's more we can do. Um, and and if I look now, what I'm working on, Angela, one is flexible models. Um, our our models need to be much more flexible to cater to all the demands that we have in our different personal pathways. And so we've got flex models, take time, et cetera. They're good, they're not perfect yet. And I, I need to create more flexibility in our models so that all folks can thrive no matter where you are in your life, life journey. Um, the second notion is um, we've made a big stride around inclusion, but I'd like to move it to inclusion with a capital I, which is as we celebrate the diversity of mixed teams, how do we absolutely ensure that the team is more than the sum of the parts. And we're celebrating the diversity of that team, not just making folks feel comfortable working together. And I think that's the next unlock for us is how do we move from the notion of inclusion of bringing everybody in and, and creating a safe environment to creating an environment where folks can thrive. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure we're, we're fully there yet. Um, and then maybe the, the last part I would close on is um, I'm wiring this into the expectation of leaders in the firm. Uh, this isn't something on the side. It's, it's now critical to the um, advancement within our firm. Uh, and so if you want to lead in McKinsey over time, you actually have to be um, a role model on aspects of diversity and inclusion. Um, so I'm, I'm obsessed with making more progress here. I'm excited by what we've done, but I, I think this is a, a huge unlock for us. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you, Bob. We appreciate your efforts in driving that. Um, and I'd like to close off this session. Thank you, first of all, for making the time to come speak with us, especially with, with, with what happened with the D yesterday. I um, know. Sorry. I still, I look terrible. I apologize for that. But uh, oh, no, no worries. It's so fine. Thank you, Bob. If this was a big theater at Harvard, we'd give you a round of applause in the audience, but like a virtual one we'll have to do. So yeah. thank you, Bob, for making the time to come speak with us. Oh, hey, and, and just let me thank, thank all of you. These are, um, these are great questions. And, and the, the part I guess I just closed back with with your overall theme, Angela, that you, you framed is, mm -hmm. I do think we have a moment, right? We're all change agents in our society. And the question that I ask is, um, how do we take advantage of the moment here with all these confluence of forces to drive change? You know, my, my interpretation of that is the sustainable inclusive growth. It may be other manifestations, but I I just don't want us to miss this window. <laughs> and, um, and I think it's conversations like this that may embolden us. So I, I really appreciate you, you bringing me on. No, thank you. And we'll make sure to amplify this message that, that this is the moment to make that change. So thank you, Bob. All right. Thanks, everybody. Wonderful.